Hello, 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 everybody. And today's episode is all about heat. That's right. Things are going to be hotting up in the lab. We've got some good experiments to do that involve heat, and I've got some science toys to show you as well. Now, lots of you will know that things expand or take up more space when they get hot. I'm going to draw a little balloon here. It's not completely filled up. Now, if I tie the end of my balloon and I put it in a hot place, maybe in some boiling water, the balloon will get bigger. Now, that's rather strange if you think about it, because we've tied the end of the balloon, so it's not like any more air can get into the balloon. What's happening is that the air inside the balloon is the same amount of air, but when it's hot, it takes up more space. So the balloon expands. Now to understand why that is, we need to go back to yesterday's video and think about the atoms of air that are in that balloon. For those of you that watched yesterday's video, you will have learned that as atoms warm up, they vibrate or move faster. So a cold atom is still vibrating, but a hot atom will be vibrating much, much faster and also shooting around, moving very, very quickly and bouncing around. So what happens to the atoms in our cold balloon compared to our hot balloon? Well, when we heat them up, the atoms bounce around even faster within the balloon. And when the atoms bump into the walls of the balloon, because they're moving faster, they transfer more of a push, more of an energy to the walls of the balloon. You can think of this like throwing a tennis ball at a tin can. If you throw the tennis ball quite lightly, and the tennis ball isn't moving very quickly, you might not knock the can over. You might not have enough force to do that. But if you chuck the tennis ball as hard as you can and it hits the can, it will have enough energy to knock that can over. And the atoms in our hot balloon have got a lot more energy and they're hitting the walls of the balloon with more energy and they're pushing the walls of the balloon more than the cold atoms. And so that the balloon is actually being pushed outwards or stretched. So it looks like the balloon gets bigger. OK, so we've learned that air takes up more room when it's hot and takes up less room when it's cold. But is that the same for everything? Does everything get bigger when it gets warmer? Well, yes, pretty much it does even solids like this mug. When you heat the mug up, it gets a little bit bigger. Now, you're not going to notice it because it's a very small change, but it's important to know that it is true. This mug will get slightly bigger when it's hot. An invention that you might have at home is an old fashioned thermometer. Now, I'm not talking about those clever electric ones that you can get nowadays. This is an old fashioned thermometer. And inside, it has a bead of mercury. We talked about that yesterday as well, didn't we? So there's the silvery liquid metal mercury, and it's contained safely within the glass because as I said yesterday, mercury is incredibly dangerous and poisonous. So they've encased it safely in the glass so it can't get out and hurt you. But what's interesting is that the mercury has a little reservoir down at the bottom of the thermometer, and then it's got an incredibly thin glass pipe for the mercury to travel up. When the mercury down here is cold, it takes up less space. And so less of the mercury is being pushed up. And so the level of mercury will show a lower level. It will show a temperature maybe down here in the 10 degrees area. When we put the mercury in something hot, it takes up more space. And because it can't push its way out this way, it pushes up the little glass spout and we see the level of mercury rise. And the higher it goes, the higher the temperature the thermometer indicates, all the way up to 100, this one. This is up to 100 degrees centigrade. So what we'll do is we'll quickly try this one out. We'll pop it in some warm water and we'll see if we can measure the temperature up here because boiling water should be around about 80 or 90 degrees, shouldn't it? Um, it will be 100 when it comes straight out of the kettle, but it will quite quickly cool down to more like 90 or 80. Right, let's have a look. So I've got some quite hot water in my mug and I'm going to put the thermometer in it 
And let's watch and see that mercury metal expanding. There's the mercury. Can you see it's going up past 80? Now the big lines are ones and the little lines are halves. So that's just about going up to 82 degrees, look. I'll take it out. Let it cool off a bit. And then let's see it go up again. Can you see it shooting up just about to pass 80? There we go. So a thermometer works by having a little reservoir of a liquid. It can be mercury or it actually can be another liquid like alcohol. And then a thin spout for the mercury to rise up. The hotter it gets here, the more this wants to expand or get bigger. And because it can't push its way out of the glass here, the glass is very strong, it goes up the spout and pushes higher for a hotter temperature and falls lower for a lower temperature. So that's how a thermometer works. So thermometers can be a really useful way of telling how hot something is by using this property. Another cool invention I've got is this. Have you ever seen anything like this before? It's a bit unusual, isn't it? Well, it's called a finger boiler. It's designed for people to use to show this phenomenon in science, the way that gases and liquids expand as they get warmer. So the way it works, is we've got some air or some gas trapped in the glass bottom here. When we warm up this gas, we're going to cause it to expand. Um, it's going to push this blue liquid around the little straw and it's going to create a bubbling effect at the top. So what I'll do is I'll put my hand here to warm up the air in this bowl and we'll see what happens. Can you see? The hot air is expanding and pushing the blue liquid up to the top bulb. And when it runs out of liquid, it will start to push the air instead. And we'll get this lovely boiling effect. Now, don't worry, it's not actually boiling. It's actually quite cool to the touch. But because the air is being pushed up through the blue liquid now, it looks a bit like the liquid is boiling. So you can actually see that the heat of my hand is making the air expand and is pushing it up to the top chamber. It works the same in reverse, believe it or not. If I put my hand on the top bulb, I will make the air up here expand and that's going to push the blue liquid all the way back down again. So let's try that. I'll grab the top bit now and I'll let the bottom bit go. And you can see it's pushing all of the blue liquid back down again. And we get a bubbling effect on the bottom this time as well. So a lovely little science toy, that one. It's called a finger boiler or a hand boiler. And it's a beautiful, very delicate piece of scientific art called the hand boiler. There we go. We can do some fun experiments with this bottle to see the effect of the air pressure going up as we warm up the air inside this bottle. So what I'm going to do is, firstly, I'm going to show you that hot air takes up more space than cold air. So to begin with, I've got a normal two litre plastic bottle here, and I'm just going to give it a bit of a squeeze. Give a bit of a squeeze like this, and I'm going to put the cap on quite tightly to not allow any more air in. So as you can see, at the moment, the air in this bottle is taking up the space, but there's a gap because I've given it a squeeze. If I warm the air up in this bottle, I can make it take up more space, push against the walls of this bottle even harder, and it should inflate the bottle out to its normal shape. So I've got my squeeze bottle there, and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna warm up the air in the bottle by pouring some hot water over the top of it. Okay, so I'll hold the bottle so you can see the gap there, and let's pour some hot water onto the bottle and see what happens. Can you see what's happened? The bottle has taken its old shape again. The air in the bottle has got hot and expanded. It's pushed out and it's restored the bottle to its shape. 
We can try this same experiment in reverse. Let me show you how. This time, I'm going to start with hot air in the bottle and I'm going to cool it down. This should mean that the air in the bottle takes up less space and we should see the bottle getting crushed because the air inside is not pushing as hard against the walls of the bottle. When we cool the air down, it's going to take up less space and it's going to want to pull the bottle into a crushed shape. Now, as you know, when we're using boiling water from the kettle, you do need to have a grown up to help you with this experiment. But it's not too difficult to do. I've got my bottle stood in a bowl just to catch any spillages. And I'm going to pour a small amount of boiling water into the bottle and I'm going to do the lid up. Now, what's going to happen is the boiling water is going to fill the bottle with hot air. When I do the lid up, I've now closed that bottle off. No air can get in or out. I'm then going to pour cold water on the bottle to cool the air down and we'll see what happens to the shape of the bottle. So first boiling water goes in and this heats up the air in our bottle. Now the air inside here is quite hot. In fact, I can now touch the bottle and it feels hot. So that's perfect. We've got hot air in our bottle. I'm now going to cap the bottle off to trap the air inside it. There we go. We've now got our hot air in the bottle. What do we do now? Well, we're going to pour cold water onto the bottle. I would drizzle this down the sides if I were you, just to maximize the cooling. Let's see if we can make the bottle change shape. What do you think? Our bottle has been crushed. Pretty cool, huh? Now, if I leave it in the cold water for even longer, the boiling water that I put down here is going to cool off even more. So you'll find your bottle continues to get crushed even for a few minutes after leaving it in the cold water. You can leave it for a little while if you like, or you could put the bottle into a freezer and see what happens. Now this effect is really important as things get bigger, because if you have a large empty tank, let's say a big water tank or something that's sealed off, if it gets hotter or colder, it can cause the tank to either expand and sometimes it will even burst or it can get crushed. Now, what you can see here is a petrol tanker. Now, petrol tankers have special valves in them that allow air in so that you don't get pressure building up or you don't get pressure becoming too low in the tank. But in this example, somebody forgot to open those valves. So it's a little bit like putting a cap on the bottle. After a little while, just like the bottle got crushed, the metal tanker gets crushed, but it's a lot louder and more exciting than the plastic bottle. As you can see, it's made a complete mess and ruined a perfectly good tanker. We can do a slightly more scientific version of this experiment with these two syringes. Now, there's air in this syringe and there's air in this syringe and I've connected the syringes with this pipe as well. If I increase the pressure in one syringe, you can see the pressure pushes the other syringe out. If I increase the air pressure on this syringe, you can see it pushes the other syringe out. We're going to do an experiment. I've got 20 millilitres of air in this syringe and I've got no millilitres of air in this syringe. If I increase the pressure on this syringe by maybe heating it up and making those air molecules bounce around even more, they're going to push. They're going to want to get bigger and they're going to push along the pipe to this syringe and they're going to push it out. We're going to be able to get a measurement of how many millilitres more the air wants to take up. How much more space the air wants to take up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this syringe in some hot water and we're going to watch this syringe to see how much of a push it gets. OK, so I've got my little syringe there, which I hope you can see. And I've tucked the big syringe in this jug so I can pour some hot water in with it. That's going to heat up the air in this syringe and hopefully push some air into this one. Let's add the boiling water and see what happens. There 
There we go. So I just gave it a little push there just to get it started. But as you can see, three milliliters of air have gone into this syringe and the other syringe is still at 20, look. So this one hasn't moved, but this one has. About three and a half milliliters of air. So 20 milliliters of cold air have expanded in the boiling water to 20 here and another three here. So 23 milliliters. So that gives us a little measurement of how much this air is expanding when we put it in the boiling water. We started with 20 and we've gone up to 23. Not too bad. Now, clever human beings quite quickly figured out that we could use this effect to create all sorts of wonderful inventions. And the basis for most of them is something called a piston. Now, a piston is really a bit like a bike pump. It's an arm that moves in and out of a container and it usually has an airtight seal in it. So this is a little diagram of what a steam engine would look like. We have something called a boiler here, which is just a metal tank filled with water. And we light a fire under the boiler to start heating this water up and turning it into steam. Now, as the water turns into steam, it expands. It wants to take up more room. And it can't escape the boiler because it's an airtight metal box, but we can channel the steam through a pipe into a piston. And it will flow here into the piston chamber and it will start to push strongly on the piston here. And it will push the piston out of the piston. So we get a push force from our steam. You can imagine this bicycle pump as my piston as the steam goes into the bottom, it pushes the piston out. So we can turn steam or any hot gas really, but steam is always a good one. We can turn steam into a push force. And this is the basis for all sorts of amazing inventions. Now here's a very ancient toy indeed. We think that this toy is probably more than three or 4,000 years old. It's called a hero's engine, and it's the very first kind of steam engine ever developed. It's really simple. It's a piece of cork so that the whole thing floats, and then it's a piece of copper tube. One end, one end is pointing out this way, and the other end is pointing out that way. And if we look on the other side, the copper comes up into a little loop and then back to the other side. And there's a candle there as well, which we're going to light. I've swapped the candle out for a little smaller one now, actually, just to allow you to see it a bit better. Let's see what happens when we light the candle on our hero's engine. Now, to get it started, we need to get a little bit of water into the copper tube here. So I'm just going to put it under the water until I see some bubbles coming up. And that's going to tell me that some water has gone into the tube. So I'll submerge it like this. Try and get a few bubbles to go. OK. Let's turn it upside down and see if we can get it working. While we're waiting for it to heat up, I'll show you how it works. So I've got my copper tube going around in a loop here and you'll notice both ends are under the water and I've got my candle. Now sitting inside the tube is a little drop of water here. And as the candle heats it up, that drop of water is going to turn to steam and it's going to expand. The water is going to get pushed out as steam and it's going to shoot out of these pipes. Now, a bit like a Catherine wheel, if I draw it from the bottom, because we've got one pipe going out that way, and on the other side, we've got another pipe going out that way. We end up with a spinning force. And the hero's engine wants to spin. Oh, something's happening. Whoa. Oh, look at it go. Oh, it's really, really going. 
And you can see some bubbles and jets of water shooting out from underneath as well. Amazing. I'm going to keep it away from the sides. Wow, isn't that incredible? I'm impressed with that. So there we go, the very first steam engine ever made. It was more used as a curiosity or a little toy rather than anything useful that you could use to, say, drive a train or drive something else. There's not a lot of power in this and I can stop it quite easily. Look, if I just touch it, I can stop it spinning. But it does want to spin again quite quickly. Now, in the basic Heroes engine, the spouts are pointing in opposite directions. So we get a spinning motion. But if we had both spouts pointing in one direction, we'd just get a push in one direction. And the Heroes engine would move the other way. So we'd just get a push force that would move the Heroes engine. I've got another more fun version of the Heroes engine here, with both the spouts facing out in the same way. And it's in the form of a boat look. Inside you can see the two pipes, just like the Heroes engine. But on this model, you can see both of them poke out the back. So for this type of Heroes engine, we're going to get a motion to push the boat forwards. And hopefully it's going to go round and round and round my bowl like this. To power this boat, I've got a little candle here, which is going to provide the heat that we need to boil that water and create our steam. So I'm going to put the candle in. Okay, it is now burning in there. You can see some smoke. Whoa! Oh, that was quick. So there you have it, a very old Indian toy, this one, called a putt-putt boat, and it works with a candle and some water. Now onto something a little bit more high-tech. This is a beautiful piece I picked up, actually on the recommendation of Mrs. Kuypers, who said that I should have one of these in my life. It's called a Stirling engine, and if you look carefully at the bottom, if I give it a spin, you can see that there is a piston that moves up and down, look. So we've got hot air pushing this piston up and down. And the piston is connected to the wheel. As the piston pushes up, it's going to give the wheel a little kick. And then the piston will go down again. And each time it will give it a little bit of a kick and spin the wheel. So we need to heat the air up inside the piston. So we're going to use a mug of hot water to do that. But I thought I'd also show you my awesome Constellations mug. This is another effect that heat can have. It can cause some things to change colour. This is a special ink called thermochromic ink. It's black when it's cold, but it turns transparent when it's hot. So printed underneath this black thermochromic ink are the constellations. But you can't see them at the moment because the black ink is still black. However, when we warm up the ink, you'll see what happens. And there, you can see all the constellations now painted onto the night sky. If I pop my Stirling engine on top, we're now heating the air inside the piston here and we're causing it to expand and want to push up 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 and that pushing force is going to travel up this little wire it's going to give our wheel a little spin oh it's already wanting to go look oh wonderful that was quick There you can see the piston moving up and down, and it's connected to something called a flywheel. It's called a Stirling engine after its inventor. I believe the scientist who invented these was a, a Mr. Stirling, or perhaps even a Professor Stirling. 
And that will keep spinning for as long as the mug is hot underneath. So quite a while. We'll put that to one side for the moment. You can keep spinning. Now this is one of my favorite toys that I own. It's called a hogs engine or a hogs motor, but it's actually another form of a Stirling engine. You can see we've got a glass container here and inside it, we've got a piston that moves. You can see it's a little bit burned here. We're gonna heat up this end with a flame and we're gonna see the effect that it has. This expanding air is gonna push the piston out and we're gonna end up with a spinning motion. Now this burner burns alcohol. Inside here, we have a wick and I'm gonna put some alcohol into the burner. Okay, pop the top on and screw it tightly up. Okay, I don't know if any of you noticed there, but I did spill some alcohol. And when I light this, that spilled alcohol is gonna burst into flame, taking my poor kitchen with it. So I'm carefully going to dry up the spillage just to make sure that we don't have any disasters, boys and girls. You wouldn't want to see my kitchen burn down, would you? Let's light our hogs engine and see what happens. Okay, so the air in this end is now expanding and pushing my piston out. You can see, if I let it go, it wants to push out. Now when it gets hot enough at the end, we'll end up with a full rotation. At the moment it's just pushing a little bit, but... Oh, can you see it starting to get a bit closer to going all the way around? Kind of just getting stuck on that last bit there. Nearly, nearly, and we've got it. Now this is also a great example of how important it is to oil your moving parts, because this is quite an old model and without any oil, it turns like this. But if I get some oil into the mechanism and allow those parts to move more freely, it speeds up quite dramatically. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just spray a little bit of oil into the top there. Oh, it's already moving a bit faster, you can see. A Little bit of oil here. There we go. She's running smoothly now. You'll see me putting some oil onto the next invention as well. Isn't that marvellous? If I stop the mechanism, I can let it go and it will start again. So there we have our two Stirling engines running nicely. They're both similar kinds of engine because they run on hot air. In this one, the hot air is in the piston here and is pushing up and down. And in this one, the hot air is in the glass part and is pushing left and right or in and out. But they do run very nicely. Now this last one is my favorite by far. The two previous engines I showed you were called Stirling engines and they run by making hot air expand. Now hot air does expand quite a lot as we've seen, but it's not particularly strong. The push that it generates is not as strong. If you want to make something really, really move, the best idea is to use a different gas. Not hot air, which is a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen and carbon dioxide, but hot water or steam. Now steam has got great power to it, and this is a real steam engine. It's got a boiler, which is this part at the back, and it's got a little firebox. So we're gonna put our firebox in there and we're gonna to start to boil some water inside the boiler here. When the steam is ready, it's gonna be piped through these little pipes that you can see. You see those pipes? Into the piston and this is our steam piston here. You can see as the piston moves in and out, the wheel behind it moves as well. 
So this is what we're going to be using our steam to drive, this in and out motion. Now this thing is amazing, it's quite dangerous, it's hot, it's noisy, it drips oil, just like a real old steam engine. And it's great fun to play with. So let's get it set up. The first thing we need to do is put some water in the tank. Can you see the filling cap? It's just here. We've got to very carefully undo it. There it is. And we're going to put our water in there. I've got a little funnel to do this. If I take the firebox off, you can see a little water gauge. Here's the water level. I don't know if you can see it. If I give it a bit of a shake, you can see the water in there. So we're going to fill her up just to below the fill line here. There we go. Let's take the funnel off and put the cap back on. And make sure we do the cap up nice and tightly because we don't want that steam to escape. Now the next most important thing is to make sure our steam engine is oiled. So a little bit like I did with the Stirling engine, I'm going to use some oil on all of the parts that I think might move. And that's going to, as we learned in a previous video, reduce friction. So how are we going to make our steam engine warm up? Do you know what steam engines would have used in the olden days in their firebox? That's right, they would have used coal. And we could use some coal today, or maybe even some charcoal. It would work quite well, I think. Nowadays, we use a white fuel. Now this is a solid fuel, a bit like coal, but it's a chemical called hexamine. And hexamine burns very cleanly. You might know that old steam trains used to cover everything with horrible black soot. And I don't want my lovely kitchen covered with horrible black soot. So what's special about hexamine is it burns without all that horrible soot. We're going to light the hexamine on fire and we're going to push the tablet into the steam engine like this and it's going to start to boil the water in the boiler. Okay. It's hard to see, but the hexamine is on fire. It burns with an almost colourless flame, but you can just about see it against the steam engine there. We're going to put the flame into the firebox. And now we have to wait for the water to boil. So here's our steam train heating up. What we're looking for is we're looking for the steam to go into this piston and to cause the piston to go from in to out like that look and in doing so you can see it's going to spin the wheel and it's this wheel here that's going to be connected to the other wheels. There's also a little whistle just like a real train and the whistle lets you know if there's enough pressure to run the engine. If it doesn't make much of a whistling noise it needs more time to heat up. Let's try the whistle. Nothing at all. So that tells me the water isn't boiling yet. We haven't got any pressure to shoot out and create our steamy whistle. Okay, I'm starting to see some little bubbles appearing in the reservoir. And I'm starting to hear some noises that sound a bit like boiling water. Let's try the whistle and see if we get any steam coming out now. Can you hear the hiss? Now it's not strong enough yet to drive our engine, but it proves that we've got some pressure building up. I can hear a hissing noise. When you hear the whistle sound, that shows that the steam is strong enough to drive the engine. Oh, we're nearly there. Let's see if we can get this started. Oh. We're definitely getting a pushing force on that piston now. A little bit more pressure needed. And there we have it. Our very own steam train.
Let's hear the whistle. So there you have it, a real steam engine, just like the olden days. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.